welcome to Untamed Unfiltered. I'm Amanda Nicholson. And I am Aaron Provencio. And today we are joined by three very special guests, Gail Buell, Jackie Kozlowski, and Melissa Moore. How's it going today, everyone? Great. Awesome. Going great. Well, thank you guys so much for being here with us. Uh, for any of our newer viewers, if you guys haven't watched Untamed Unfiltered before, this is our after the show discussion where we get to talk a little bit more about each episode of Untamed and keep the conversation going and keep sharing stories. So we are very excited today to talk to Gail and Jackie and Melissa and full disclosure, I refer to them as the training trifecta because everything I know about ambassador training, I learned from them. So this is a highlight for me. Uh, I'm very excited. And um, just to kick us off, why don't each of you guys introduce yourselves, maybe mention where you are now and um, how long, I'm also curious, uh, how long you've been working with animal ambassadors. Oh my goodness. Okay, so I'll start. Um, I, <laughs> this will probably age me, but I've been working with ambassadors for over 30 years. Uh, and I started at a nature center, uh, did a lot of volunteer work for a, a rehab center that had ambassadors. And then my first professional learning how to train was at a zoo, at the Minnesota Zoo World of Bird Show. Uh, and so I was professionally trained how to train. Um, and I say that I'm a, a very, very, very lucky to have fallen into facilities and places that were all about best practices um, and learning the science um, behind training uh, so you could apply it anywhere. So, and now currently I work for the Raptor Center at the University of Minnesota in a department called Partners for Wildlife, which we don't directly train ambassador animals. Uh, and I, I'm working mostly with wildlife rehabilitators, but I also work with folks who are interested in learning more about training ambassadors and how specifically to do it. Toss it to you, Jackie. All right. So I've been, when I actually count, I've been working with ambassador animals for about 15 years now. I got my start in Delaware as an intern at our local zoo. And through the years, my career path has led me into, you know, focusing on bird shows and working with ambassador birds. I know I'm some stuff with wildlife rehabilitation as well. I'm currently the senior bird show trainer at Tracy Aviary in Salt Lake City, Utah. And this is my fifth anniversary there. I guess it's my turn then. Um, I started working um, with ambassador animals as a volunteer and intern, and this will definitely date me, in 1984, um, and had my first pro professional position um, in 86 as um, uh, a bird show trainer. So uh, working at the Milwaukee County Zoo doing a contract bird show. So raptors are really my first love. Um, but I've had the opportunity to work as a curator of birds and um, mostly a wildlife educator, also in wildlife rehabilitation, though, and um, throughout the years have kind of um, found my way finally back to the Midwest, and I'm the curator of animals at the Peoria Zoo in Peoria, Illinois, um, where we don't have a lot of ambassadors here, but we do a lot of training and enrichment with the animals. Uh, it's been kind of a journey for me coming out of the world of birds and now landing in a world that's uh, even even larger and more expanded than that. So um, yeah, it's been a long, a long journey and, and really a lot of fun. And over, as you said, such a long journey and, and so many years working with ambassador animals, I'm sure that the three of you have had opportunities to work with all sorts of incredible different species. And so I'm wondering if you could tell our viewers what you're currently working with now, and then what is your favorite type of animal to work with as an ambassador? Oh boy, that's a start out with the hard questions. Yeah. <laughs> so here is the, the, I hope I don't steal your guys' answer. Um, my favorite to work with is the one I'm working with at the time. So whatever animal I happen to be working with is my favorite. Um, mm -hmm. I do also have most of my experience with birds and a lot of that with raptors. Um, 
Boy, ah, uh, boy, that's a hard one. Um, currently, I'm not working directly with a lot of ambassadors. I'm doing a lot of mentoring uh, with other folks, uh, but I have been doing actually a lot of training with my horse. Uh, mm-hmm. And that's been a lot of fun. And my horse has actually really helped me with my wildlife ambassador training. There's a lot of crossover, but because horses are prey animals and a lot of the animals that we are working with can be prey animals, it's given me just an amazing insight on, on what kinds of things I should be thinking about. So um, as far as a favorite wild animal, oh my gosh. Okay, I'm gonna say red tail and kestrel. Just two. I couldn't narrow it down. I'm good. I just couldn't. All right, my turn. So I did get my start working with, you know, a wide variety of species. And the more I work with birds, the man, the more they just get under your skin. Huh. My career, birds have been it for me. I currently work exclusively with a bird show collection of a little over 40 ambassadors and a huge variety, everything from parrots and hornbills, toucans, emus, uh, a little bit of everything, cranes, spoonbills, you name it. And from the beginning, vultures have always been in terms of favorite groups of animals, they've been it for me. And it could have to do with the very first animals I ever trained, you know, professionally was a pair of Andean condors. It was my first exposure to training. And I got to work with these two vultures and have been hooked ever since. Mm -hmm. And I mean, they are some of the most misunderstood animals out there. And when you introduce them to the public and really change people's minds about how great they are, they're just the best. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I would have to, uh, to echo both of what you both said. Um, I love vultures. I love corvids too, um, because they're so smart and you have to outthink them or stay at least even with them as you're, as you're working with them. Um, but vultures, Jackie, make a great point. When you go and speak to a group and you've got vultures in, you could really make an impression on folks about that. However, I run into the same problem you do, Gail. Every time somebody asks me, I'm like, uh, whatever animal's in front of me right now, that's, that's my favorite. Um, and you guys will attest to that, I think, because I'm constantly texting you now that I'm at Peoria Zoo, like, oh, giraffes are my new favorite animal, or talking are my new favorite animal, or whatever it is. Um, I think what it really comes down to for me, uh, when I, I was thinking about this uh, just the other day, it's really about the aha moment I love to be there when whatever animal it is, and even really with people, just to see when they go, oh, I get what you want, you know? So it doesn't matter so much the animal or the species. It's more about that little moment when you are able to finally communicate what it is you've been trying to get across and the animal clicks and says, I get it now and can perform that behavior. So you know, although I could spend all day listing my favorite species, I think it's really, that's probably what it is. It's more of a selfish thing that I just love to see that happen. It's kind of well, cool. Well, you get positive, positively reinforced for it too, right? And right, I, exactly. agree. I, boy, when you said that, I'm like, oh yeah. And when I'm, yeah, uh-huh. train, yeah new trainers, I, I describe it as you can almost see it. Yeah. You know, you can almost see that light bulb, you know, right. maybe it's an LED light bulb now or a compact fluorescent, not an incandescent, but you can almost see it. Um, and it is a pretty amazing moment because after that, the animal's like, I got this. And you can just see the, almost the joy, the engagement, I don't know what you want to call it, uh, with the animal, whatever species. Yeah, so, I agree. Yeah, when you make the connection with them, you know that. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Super cool. Yeah. What an answer. Way to go. <laughs> I think that's way better than giraffes. I don't know. <laughs> I want to work with giraffes though. They seem oh, pretty cool. Man, man. <laughs> yeah. My new favorite is talking though. So they're the big ox mm-hmm. looking. Yeah. Yeah. Super mm-hmm. cool too. Hogs. Oh, and red river hogs. And yeah, I could go oh. on. Yeah. <laughs> So, I think the hogs would be loads of fun. I mean, they are so smart. Yep. Um, that would be, yeah. Yeah, they're huh. super, super cool too. 
Sorry, we're talking over you. What else, what else you got for us? <laughs> so, well, we, when we put together this episode, we knew, you know, we really wanted to guide people through our entire thought process of um, our animal ambassadors, their jobs, how they come to be with us, um, which really kind of goes back to how do we properly select for them, which really goes back to like the foundational thing for me is it's getting into animal welfare. Mm -hmm. And Gail, you were in this episode. Uh, that was your, you know, your big chunk of the, the episode was really talking about animal welfare. Um, and, you know, you got into some of the concepts and, and all of that and the definitions. Um, so we probably don't have to go too deeply into that as a concept, but I'm, I'm interested in all of your times. You guys have all been working in this field for a long time. Um, what's, what's changed with regard to animal welfare? What have you seen on your journey? Oh my gosh, I think it has changed just dramatically. Um, yep. Over the decades <laughs> that I've been involved and Melissa's been involved, Jackie's still a pup, but she, you know, still even in the 15 years she's been <laughs> <The> changed. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think it's changed dramatically. Um, there was definite. There's definitely now in animal training uh, for ambassador animals. Uh, it is a lot more science based. So mm -hmm. that means that we're not saying, well, it works just because it works. We're like, this is working because of X or because of Y or because of Z. Or, and uh, we can also now, okay, if we can look at the behavior of the animal, the animal's giving us information and then it's a, a more of a two-way conversation instead of a one-way conversation. No, I want you to do this. So you're gonna do this. Um, and also I think that it is tending toward, um, least intrusive practices yeah. Yeah. so more positive and least intrusive practices and and uh lots more choice uh for the animal and so yeah i think that it's exploded what do you guys think for change yeah i think the biggest change i've seen is just that the conversations are happening yeah. that now everywhere you go you're talking about well this is this is how we're doing it or i've seen this somewhere else and whether it's within your team your department the facility you're at the field in general everybody has this on their mind you know how can we provide the best lives and the best welfare for these animals in our care and it is even the things that are difficult to talk about things like quality of life mm -hmm. or selecting what's the right ambassador for the job i mean we're starting to get to the point where the conversations that need to happen really are and i think that's the coolest thing about that is like welfare is now the hot topic and look at what's come out of it look at where we're heading and i think that's the coolest thing yeah, I, I agree with both of you. And uh, I remember literally in the 80s, um, we didn't really talk about animal welfare as a concept. I mean, how, you know, if somebody said, how's your animal's welfare? We'd say, well, he's got food and water and, you know, he looks fine. So I guess he's okay. We didn't go to the next level. And like, like Gail said, um, you know, talk about the science behind it. And, and Jackie, like you were talking about with their going even farther, you know, talking about how does their natural history affect their welfare? If this is an animal that does X, Y, Z in the wild, you know, well, do they need to do X, Y, Z when they're in managed care too? You know, how does that, how does that work? And, and what part of, of that is critical? And is that affecting their welfare negatively? Um, or is it affecting it at all? You know, we're, we're coming up with measures now to actually measure and mark the, the welfare of the animal. And sure, it's just a moment in time, but this is something that's a hot topic in the, in the zoo community right now. So it's, it's on the forefront of my mind. You know, we do welfare assessments regularly and we're trying to assign a number to a qualitative thing, which is not, it's not a science yet, but it's moving in that direction. Uh, you guys have anything to add to that? Well, the other thing that I, I was thinking about as you guys were talking is, boy, back in the 90s, that's when the International Association of Avian Trainers and Educators formed, 
Uh, before that, certainly there was uh, the marine mammals. Uh, they had an organization as well, and there were a couple other organizations, but most of them, with the exception of the avian trainers and educators, was definitely more focused towards zoos because yeah. that's who could have those like marine mammals, for example, right? right. But with IAATE, looking at, at trying to not just have zoo professionals attend conferences and look at their newsletters and things like that, but other people, right. there have been just a plethora of really good professional organizations that are geared toward operant conditioning and working with ambassadors, but also working with pets and working with uh, equines and all these other animals. I mean, I can name off five or six right now that are, and podcasts now and blogs and all of these things. So it's a lot more accessible to people, which I just love. Yeah, I would agree. One good thing to come out of the pandemic. <laughs> well, and it hasn't just been this year, but I think True. that the technology with Zoom, I mean, a lot of people have had conferences that were online this year, and that definitely made things a lot more accessible and a lot more affordable um, because notoriously professional animal trainers don't make that much money. So, <laughs> you know, yeah, let's, let's get that let's out talk there about that for a minute. <laughs> yeah, let's talk about that one. <laughs> um, you know, I, one thing I want to add to when, when I first started in this field, when you were talking about, somebody brought up a question about the welfare of the animals in your care. Um, it was almost uh, something that would set you back on your heels and put you on the defensive because it was coming, um, it was assumed to be coming from sort of an animal rights sort of perspective. You know, we don't want animal and animals in, in human care. They shouldn't be here. They should be in the wild, whatever. It was really early on in conservation where there wasn't a lot of precedent for having like raising California condors in, in captivity, you know, and releasing them. So there wasn't this history of, of making a positive conservation impact by having animals in human care. So it was, um, it was really kind of a push, push and pull thing where animal rights were on one side and people who kept animals in human care were on the other side. And I think what we've seen with this conversation that Jackie mentioned of, of talking about welfare of animals we're really, now we're finally getting to talk about the welfare of our animals and not have to push back and say, oh, but they're, you know, they're fine, you know, and, and be afraid of that conversation. We can actually have that conversation, ask the tough questions, you know, should this animal be in captivity? Should it be? And, and how is its quality of life, like you guys said? So I, I think the evolution of this um, of this topic really could be a, a whole conversation and podcast in and of itself. It's really a huge topic. Yeah, that is a good point. Now that, you know, when you're standing out there with a peregrine falcon on your glove and a guest walks up to you and asks you like, is this animal happy or how is their life for like, are they missing something because they're not in the wild anymore? You can actually, talk about what your facility is doing, what you personally are doing. And even as Gail mentioned, the science behind it, like mm -hmm. actually having measurements and, and checks and balances. And it is a new and exciting way to think about. It. Yeah. Well, that actually plays kind of perfectly into my next question for you, which is that oftentimes you will hear people who say there should be no animals in captivity, mm -hmm. um, an animal in the cage is an unhappy animal, things like that. And I'm just curious what you all think is the value that these ambassador animals hold of being accessible to people. And, and how would you respond to that now, now that you've kind of already spoken about, but in this new age of animal welfare, what is your response to that kind of that kind of um, question nowadays? Well, as far as ambassador animals in captivity, I mean, they definitely need to serve a human purpose, right? Um, so what we're often doing with environmental education, uh, whether you're at a zoo or a nature center or a place like the Raptor Center, is we are definitely doing conservation messaging, right? We want that the person, the guest that's coming up and talking to us or being in a program to get an up close and personal look at this animal and maybe watch some of their behaviors and then we can interpret them. And we want people to form not a 
pet bond, right? Not like you do with your cat or your dog or anything, but just kind of almost that aha connection. Like, mm -hmm. oh my gosh, you know, in a photograph or when I've seen these birds outside, I've never been able to see the colors of the feathers or how they glisten in the sun or, oh my gosh, that vulture is spreading his wings. What is he doing? Um, so I think that the live animals give a, a immediacy and an importance and then especially how we craft our messages um because what we're trying to do is affect change we are trying to say hey look uh you know adults by how you vote believe it or not can it, it affects the environment these animals need habitat if you don't value habitat we're not going to have it and then these animals won't have a home. And we don't do, do doom and gloom. We always wanna end on a hopeful message. We wanna end on here's things you can do and isn't this great? Uh, you've seen one up close, now you can go look outside. So I think that that is to me, and of course I can keep going on and on and on like usual, but that's for me, <laughs> Melissa's life. What, Gail, uh, keep talking? Okay, go Melissa, go Jackie. <laughs> uh, good answer, Gail. I mean, our philosophy, yeah. yeah, it was a really good answer. Our philosophy at the aviary is, is just that, you know, we want people to feel and we want them to create that emotional connection with the animals. I mean, you can sprout out a million facts and there's so many resources out there, but if you just give them that little, um, point of interest, that little connection with that animal, then that's going to open up the whole world to them. And I know for me personally, you know, I was one of those kids that was always outside and, you know, my parents took me to the zoo and the aquarium. That's always where I wanted to go. And that's, I would guess what inspired me to do what I do today. And that's why I still do it is because I think I, that we're inspiring the next generation and it's about getting people to care. And once they care, then the change is going to happen. Mm -hmm. And that's yeah. the role that our animals play, you know, is, is making them care. I, th I think you, you hit it right on, uh, Jackie, and, and you remind me of one of my earliest, earliest impressions in this field. And I, I share this sometimes with people who ask me about what animal ambassadors are doing, you know, how are, how are they actually functioning? Um, I saw Shamu at uh, SeaWorld as a child and fell in love. That, that was just a huge deal for me um, because it took away this um, abstract concept of a species and suddenly this was an individual animal and it could do things that you asked it to do, you know, swim around the tank, jump up, eat a fish, whatever. Uh, I don't even remember what all it, what happened at the, the show that I saw as a child, but it made such a huge impact. Um, you know, I know, I, I absolutely, like you said, Jackie, I absolutely know that that's the kind of thing that started me down this path. And I saw a presentation once, I wish I could remember the details, where people in this field, like 86% of them surveyed had uh, had some impactful moment with a um, a nature center or at a zoo or at a wildlife center or whatever it was. Um, and, and then you think about how that grows exponentially. So if, if I have, how many people have I spoken with in, in my career, you know, and try and influenced towards a positive attitude towards nature or towards wildlife, you know, that's what it's all about. It really is about growing that and, and teaching people that they have, the opportunity to create a better world for us and for other species. You know, and I think it's even more important in today's society. Here we are sitting in front of computers again, right? Here we are watching something on electronic means. We're not outside playing like Jackie said, you know, we're not out like I used to be playing in the creek or running up and down the hill. Not that I could get up the hill now, but you know, <laughs> it's hopeful. Um, but it, it, kids aren't outside as much, you know, the world's kind of a dangerous place. So I think it's even more important today than it was when I was a teenager to have these animals available for kids to make connections to and adults too. Sorry, I went on. this is like my soapbox topic here. This is like, yeah. Well, and the other thing that I just wanted to bring up is that 
with people visiting or, or seeing these things, whether you're outside, whether you're at a zoo, nature center, whatever, uh, live animals in front of you, you never know where or when a certain person, child mm -hmm. or adult, is going to get grabbed by something. Yeah. You don't. So it, it is important to have all of these experiences certainly available. Um, and hopefully, you know, that people take advantage of them or whatever it is, because you just don't know whether it's going to be uh, uh, Shamu, whether it's going to be, you know, I'm down at the creek and I'm lifting up rocks and oh my gosh, what, you know, what kind of, this is a dragonfly larva or, or whatever it is. Um, but we certainly see that uh, having an animal that you normally can't get that close to, right. like birds, yeah or like Shamu, right? <laughs> right. Um, being able to get close to it, to see it as an individual, I think that that is really important. Again, we don't want them, people looking at these animals like, oh, I'm, I have a bond like a pet, because that's not what we're after here. But it is one of our connections to the environment, to nature, to wilderness. And, and I think that that, and we never know when we're gonna catch anybody. Yeah. True. And that's one of the things we, I, we, you know, always emphasize is that these animals do have individual personalities. I mean, they're not human personalities, but they do have quirks and likes and dislikes, uh, just like we do. And once you start to get, you know, that idea out there, especially for animals like birds, it opens up a whole new world for people. You know, one of the coworkers I worked with was a bird watcher and he always said, said now that sparrow is not just a sparrow and he thinks when he's looking at in his binoculars like what's that sparrow's personality like <laughs> and it's something uh, really fun to share with people and i think it makes that connection you know brings it home so when they look out in their backyard they're seeing more mm -hmm. i agree absolutely well that also is is kind of a nice little segue into into my next question which We're is happy to help. <laughs> and I mean Gail you mentioned behavior earlier and Jackie you mentioned natural history and I think one thing that I've noticed in recent years when I go to uh, different conferences is there also seems to be this growing trend in talking about behavior. Now some of that growing trend is also I mean because of you guys. Like I, I go to the conferences that you go to and you're there talking about behavior. So I, you're kind of setting the tone here as well. But, um, but there's been- there's, it's working. I know it's taken a long time, but man, it's paying off. <laughs> but there's, yeah, there's so much talk about behavior. And I just, I'm wondering if you each can share with everyone um, why you think that is such a critical component of caring for ambassadors. And it's really not just ambassadors, it's any mm -hmm. animal, uh, mm -hmm. whether it's a rehab animal or not. But in, in this context, we're highlighting ambassadors particularly. Um, because really on one hand, like observing behavior sounds like an incredibly simple concept, which is kind of why I love it. But yet on the other hand, it also is it's a skill to like read that and interpret it. Yeah, so I love behavior. Oh my goodness, I love it. I just love observing it. I love, I get stopped, you know, looking out the window and I'm like, oh, what is that? You know, and then kind of go down that rabbit hole to try to find out what, why that's happening. So with ambassador animals, um, I was told once by the professional trainer who trained me um, and I didn't believe him at the time because I was a beginning trainer, is that the animal will tell you how to train them. But I couldn't, I couldn't, wasn't there yet because I was still learning all the training things and reading their behavior was still a little bit beyond me. But as I started working with that animal more and more and more, you have to develop your observation skills and your observation skills gives you lots of information because the animal, as far as training is concerned, is giving all kinds of body language off. And that body language is a language that we need to learn how to interpret. And so natural history and behavior is very interesting to me because of course, that's, I need to, I need to know what that means when they're doing this versus that. Mm -hmm. um, and then also 
with ambassador animals in captivity, using their natural history, they're hardwired for that. They've been out in the wild for a certain amount of time. They're hardwired for whether it's climbing or digging or flying or, or just at least moving a lot or moving not a lot at all or how they get their food. And so the more we can think about how to mimic that, because we're not gonna be able to do it exactly, but the more we can kind of mimic that, the more comfortable they're gonna be, the more um, engaged in their surroundings they're going to be, and actually the easier it is to work with them to train them. Yeah, I couldn't agree more, Gail. And no, it is a dialogue and a communication when we're working with these animals and they're communicating through their body and through their behavior. And so we owe it to them to observe that and respect that. And the thing is, once you start to read and observe them, interpret behavior, you're able to move your community to the next level and your relationship with that animal to the next level. And that's where you really will impact their wealth, give them more choices and control over their environment, um, more options. And it is a skill. We just use the word behavior, but we're also, we're lumping into that the communication that the animals are giving to us because we can't they don't use a language with words like we do. So we just call it behavior. Well, it's their language, you know? We are able to get first person or first animal feedback from them immediately just by watching their behavior. So, um, so Jackie, you froze up for a moment. I was just kind of finishing. Ah. I hope I was finishing your sentence a little bit there, so. You did, I yeah. tagged you in. <laughs> yeah, that sums yeah. it up great. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I think I think we all agree that it's it's a skill, and you just have to you know kind of practice it, and uh, that it's just part of the communication and the thing that enables you to create a relationship and better welfare for the animal that you're working with. Well, on that note, what advice would you have for anybody watching at home or me right now in terms of observing? and interpreting that behavior, whether it's someone like me, who's very much a novice in this animal training world, or somebody who just wants to get a little bit better at being able to observe and interpret a uh, behavior of wildlife when they're out in nature. Boy, I would say, slow down, watch, and then ask questions. Even if nobody's around say, well, I wonder why that animal is doing this. And then see if you can watch a little bit more to see if you can't figure it out. That would be the first thing. The second thing I would say is that you can learn um, about behavior and how to interpret it. There's a lot, a lot more tools out there, but one of the tools that uh, I love teaching people is field sketching. Mm -hmm. Field sketching as a skill, you don't have to think that you're good at drawing or anything like that. What it is, it's designed to catch behavior. So you do 10 second drawings or 30 second drawings. And there's a lot of online tutorials for this as well as books out there that you can get to learn how to do this. Um, and so you just sit outside with paper and pencil and you don't look at your paper actually. And you look at the animal and you're just trying to catch what is that foot doing or what is that wing doing or what is that beak doing? Um, so it's you're trying to capture very, very quickly a motion or a thing that the animal is doing. And it's a wonderful way. It may not tell you how to interpret that behavior, but it teaches you how to observe behavior. And then, I mean, like any other skill, practice makes perfect. Mm -hmm. And you don't have to even be out in nature or at, you know, a nature center or zoo i mean there's tons of videos online or nature documentaries um your dog or cat that's sitting in your room with you and just start to hone those skills on watching and then also um, practicing the language we use to describe behavior too is a skill in itself so things like uh labeling uh, and you know those other things that us humans fall into using. Uh, if you practice actually describing the behavior for what it is, um, that's a skill in itself. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I, I can't say much more than what these ladies have already said. Practice, 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 do it, observe, pay attention. And um, the only uh, things I would say novel to that are use your, your phone, take videos, watch them later. I think that's really, really helpful uh, to me just to catch some subtleties that I missed in the moment. Um, a feather flip or something that I didn't see an eye in the funny direction or whatever that I missed um, in real time. And don't be afraid to be wrong because if you're wrong in your guess, you learn something. At least that's the way I look at it. If I'm right, if I'm always right, I'm not learning. So go ahead and be wrong. You know, say, hey, I think that bird is trying to do X, Y, Z. And somebody who uh, maybe knows a little more says, no, no, that was ABC. You go, well, okay, I learned something today, you know? So that that's the only thing I can add. The other, that's the other thing that we do, oh, Jackie, go ahead. Oh, well, I was just gonna add on to Melissa's point about videoing. You know, another good tool us as teachers often overlook is videoing ourselves. Yeah. Um, and learning from our own behavior as well. Oh, I could be standing a little differently or look at how I made this more difficult for the animal I'm trying to teach. Uh, so filming our own behaviors yeah. is actually a valuable tool. Yeah. Very. Yeah. Um, I, and I mentor a fair number of people in training ambassadors and I often ask for video. And then what we'll do is we'll go over the video together because all I wanna do is tweak what they're doing. And sometimes it's their position as the trainer or they haven't seen something that I see. So I'm like, did you notice this? Uh, no, you didn't. Okay, let me let's talk about that particular behavior that the bird did this and its posture or uh, something, uh, something like that. The other thing that I was gonna say is that when any of us are working with a, a trainer, for example, and the trainer says something like, well, the bird is mean to another bird or the bird is mean to me or the bird hates me, which are all labels that really don't tell you anything. Um, what we will come back with, with is this question is we'll say, well, what does that look like? Yeah. Because what we're trying to do is get them to practice describing the actual behavior. Okay, the bird reached up with his foot or took its wing up and just wailed on the other bird. I'm making that up. You know, so you just, you, you, but you get a description of the behavior rather Was than- Was it a pigeon? It's <laughs> a pigeon. They're awful that way. Um, anyway, but then you get, you get a description of the behavior and that we can influence we can influence the behavior. I can't influence um, an animal that's mean. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, you guys just did a whole behavior seminar at the <laughs> National Wildlife Rehabilitation <laughs> Association Symposium. It was excellent. <laughs> and uh, you guys just talked about, I mean, breaking it down of observing behaviors, describing them using, you know, action words, not labels, uh, and then interpreting them. So lots of examples, really walking all of us through how to do that. And um, in that session, Melissa had this quote that just, I was like listening to this as I was doing stuff in my kitchen. And, and I actually like stopped to and rewound it to write it down just because it really resonated with me. Um, so, and that quote is, and I wrote it down here so I could read it. Uh, we have the opportunity to take the knowledge that we gain from the communication that we receive from those animals, ambassador animals, and take that and improve the lives of those animals in our care. We have lots of opportunities to change their worlds because they are in our care and we are responsible for their entire worlds, essentially. And I think it just stopped me because I'm like, wow, that's why I'm stressed out all the time, which is like, ha ha funny, except not, but I think it's, I don't know. I'm just, and I have no question in here other than like, maybe you can say more things about this because I think to me as someone who is responsible for a collection of non-releasable ambassadors, I feel this heavily sometimes. And obviously it is a privilege and a joy to work with these animals because they're, they all have personalities. It's so fun to share them with people and to uh, inspire people and their behaviors toward wildlife because of them. 
but man, it, it's a, it's a responsibility that I feel heavily some days too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, first of all, I have to say any of my high school English teachers would have probably hated that. Everywhere, but, um, <laughs> um I, I, I guess, um, I think it is a responsibility and I think it's important that we take it seriously and that we um, really think about the choices we make and how, we, how deeply we listen to the animals in terms of their communications with us, their behavior, how closely we pay attention to that. And then do we act upon what they're saying, um, saying in quotes. Uh, I think that's, that's really what it comes down to. But I like what you just said, Amanda, that you also have so much joy in it. And I think that is really important to hang on to that joy and not get bogged down in the responsibility, right? I mean, Gail, would you agree with that? What, oh, what? 110%. Uh, yeah, it's a responsibility. And boy, if things go wrong, even if it's minor, it's, it's really difficult. And then, of course, moving forward, you say, how am I going to change things so that whatever that was doesn't happen again? Um, but uh, I also agree that it, you need to keep finding the joy in it and keep finding, oh my gosh, you know, like we said at the beginning, I've been doing this for over 30 years and I still love every minute of it. Mm -hmm. And I, oh my gosh, just the privilege, like you mentioned, Amanda, the privilege of being able to work with some of these animals and the fact that I'm allowed to do this, mm -hmm. this work is just, I feel like I'm the luckiest person on the planet. Yeah. No, just really, but it is a big responsibility. Yeah, we have these signs posted in all our buildings with pictures of our birds on them. And the signs say the quality of our work is the quality of their lives. Mm. And wow. Oh, I like that quote. I want that. Yeah. yeah, it I think that's what it all comes down to and why things like this podcast and the discussion we're having here and all you know, the conversations at conferences and between individuals about, thank you, you know, gallery, uh, <laughs> conversations about welfare and choice and control and improving our skills in working with best practices and observing and interpreting behavior. All this comes back to the fact that it is a responsibility for us and we, you know, owe it to them. So, that's yeah. my I, I find it reinforcing just to, to observe the behavior and know what it means and be able to respond to that behavior. But I guess if you need more motivation than that to, to do it, I guess that's where the responsibility comes in, right? I mean, yeah. it's, uh, it, it is. And, and I think it's important to keep in mind that their worlds, if they're in our care, their entire worlds are in our care too. So to be aware that just what Jackie, your quote was perfect. You know, I mean, that, that really is the quality of, of what we do in, influences their quality of life directly. So, um, but not to get too bogged down in that. Yeah. Well, you all spoke to this immense privilege that there is inherent in working with these very special animals. And so I'm wondering kind of as we approach the end of this episode of Untamed Unfiltered, if the three of you would be willing to, and honestly, Amanda too, I'm going to go ahead and throw you into this as well, um, would be if you would be able to tell our viewers a, a special moment or a story or an ambassador that you got to work with that really just sticks in your mind as an example of what an immense privilege this, this really is. I'm not starting this one. Yeah, you do. You I need to think. It's in the script, right? Yeah. <laughs> I'm the first one in the script. All right. Uh, okay. This is going to take a couple minutes. Just for you. All right. So I worked at an environmental learning center. Yeah. Get you guys, get you guys comfortable. You comfortable? Okay. Worked at an environmental learning center in Northern Minnesota for several years. And one of the ambassador birds that I worked with was a uh, Merlin. And a Merlin is a type of falcon. It's a smaller falcon. And we have quite a few in Minnesota. This particular bird was blind on one side, so could not be released to the wild because no depth perception, but the bird was flighted. So uh, this uh, facility is named Wolf Ridge Environmental Learning Center, phenomenal facility. Anyway, uh, the 
the auditorium that I would be working in was massive and it had very tall ceilings. It didn't have the, the seats that kind of were like theater seats. So it was all, all beautiful open space and tall ceilings. So I decided that I wanted to fly this bird um, for the bird classes that they, that happened every day. And if the instructors wanted to bring their kids in and get a flight demonstration, they could do it. But I didn't want to do just what we call an A to B flight. The bird sits there, he flies straight to my glove. That's an A to B flight. I wanted to really try to demonstrate how these birds fly in the wild when they're chasing after their prey. And still can't do it perfect, but we were close. So what we, what the routine ended up is I would mark out a big giant circle on the carpet and the kids got to sit on the outside of that circle. And of course there were rules with this. They had to keep their hands in their lap. Uh, they couldn't try to reach the bird. Even if the bird landed right next to them, they could not touch that bird. Um, and I had no one that ever even tried. So they, oh, they followed instructions wonderfully. Anyway, I, I taught the bird to fly to what's called a lure. So a lure, this one looked like a bird, but it's made out of leather. And I had a big long strap on it and then I would swing it. So I'd get the bird flying and then start swinging this lure. And the bird was trained to go catch the lure. Uh, and if he catches the lure, he gets a treat. He gets food on it. So there's lots of incentive for the, for the bird. Well, we were able to get uh, in front of all these kids, uh, a figure of eight flights. So the bird would fly way up high. So we're talking 15, 20 feet and then do something what's called a wing over. So it would pause in flight. It would turn and look over its shoulder before it came down to, um, to try to catch the lure and then go back up to the other side and do it again. Oh my gosh, I still get chills thinking about that flight because it was so fun to train. And the looks on these kids' faces when this bird would go right over their head, but not touch them, but they could feel the wind. Uh, and then I would sor serve the lure to the bird so the bird could catch it. And then the bird would land on the carpet. And then they got to watch this bird eat the treat off of the thing. And then I would call the bird up to my glove. And then we would talk even more about Merlins. Um, but the experience, um, even a few years later, they got, after I left Wolf Ridge, came down to the Raptor Center, uh, they were still getting comments from some of the parents and some of the kids that, that ex they would never forget that experience. So that was one of my favorites. Yay. That's a good story. Yeah. Yeah. I found this one you know, I have to think a lot about it because it is, we have those special moments all the time. I mean, that's why we do what we do. That's what reinforces us. Uh, but currently I work with three roseate spoonbills at the aviary that I actually was the one that transported their eggs from Washington, DC to the aviary. And then they hatched there and helped raise them and all their initial learning I was involved in. And now these three confident roseate spoonbills, oh, they're just incredible ambassadors. I mean, first of all, who doesn't love bubblegum pink <laughs> spoonbills at that? Like the goofiest, most charming little things. I've never seen them walk past someone or fly past someone and uh, they always smile. It's, I mean, it's just infectious. And they'll fly huge loops around the aviary and come back home. We meet them in our theater. They know to come back there and we meet them. So we walk them all around the aviary. They have all the choice and control you could ever want um, for ambassador. They participate in our indoor shows and our outdoor shows. And I'm just privileged that I've got to be there from day one, you know, when they hatched out of their eggs to see all, all that hard work and, you know, stressful moments and, and everything just turn into these fantastic little birds. And then of course I can't, uh, I'll always feel privileged to get to work beside and meet um, Andy and Condor. Mm -hmm. If you're not familiar, he's our Andy and Condor at Tracy Aviary and is probably one of the greatest ambassador birds I've ever met. I mean, first of all, condors are impressive as anything. And he's just the most gentle, good natured bird. He's 62 this year and he still goes for walks around the aviary. And 
has changed so many people people's opinions on how great vultures are people love his relationship with helen deshaw my um great friend and his great friend as well and if you don't follow him on facebook i highly encourage you to <laughs> uh, but just in terms of birds that change my life you know his role as an ambassador and what we talked about earlier you know the reason he's at the aviary like you couldn't ask for a better bird than that that's pretty cool <laughs> and he's a pretty cool bird too it is great Definitely influenced a lot of folks mm -hmm. um I, I'm having trouble deciding on one story, so I'm going to go I with two. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to go with Jackie's <laughs> take and, and maybe do more than one here. Um, one of uh, an important lesson that that I, I got was how much along the way was how much training happens when you're not intending for training to happen necessarily consciously. And uh, we had received a um, a young. Uh, African white-necked raven at a show where I was working and he was just over three months old and uh, within a few weeks of arrival got West Nile virus and this was just at the time when West Nile was coming across the country and we didn't know what it was at first and anyway um, he ended up coming to my house and um, having to stay there and he couldn't swallow so he was being tube fed every day and I just had him like barricaded in a little room, uh, like a hard floor room, not much space. So he couldn't hurt himself and he couldn't fly. So he just wander around, but I was tube feeding him. I'd just take a syringe and um, you know, every uh, few hours, whatever the, the protocol was, I'd walk down the stairs to him and call his name. And it got to the point where he literally just walked right up to the barricade and allowed me to pick up his beak put the tube in, squirt the food in and walk away. And he would just be like, oh, okay, great, walked away. And I was astonished when I realized one day that he was just voluntarily coming over to me and allowing me to do this. I thought, I didn't teach him that. <laughs> How did that happen? And it was really, he did make it by the way, he survived and he's still doing fine right now. But it was, uh, it was quite a remarkable moment to realize that training isn't this thing that happens in a bubble. We don't just go somewhere and do training. And I kind of wish we would get away from thinking about training as something we do to animals and enrichment, something we do for them and think about those things as things we do with the animals. Um, you know, I, I learned that uh, also it was reinforced to me when I was many years ago, flying an auger buzzard. It's a, it looks like a sort of like a red tailed hawk from Africa. And we wanted this bird to fly from, as Gail was saying, an A to a B. We wanted to fly from this perch to that perch. We were in South Dakota and South Dakota has high winds on a regular basis. And um, auger buzzards have large wings and light bodies. And I was starting to get frustrated that the bird would not just fly from A to B. And I realized all of a sudden that I was stupid and I can't fly and auger buzzards know how to fly. And so I should allow them to do that. And pretty soon we, we let go of our idea, my idea of what control should be, where this bird should go and how it should do that. And I just made the criteria for the training session that he eventually goes from A to B. However he wants to get there is totally fine and is up to him. And again, it was a really important learning uh, piece for me and a real eye opener because he knows what he's doing. He knows how the wind is up there high. And these were very high perches. So there was a lot of wind up high. And eventually, if I just stopped trying to force him to do what I thought he should be doing, he flew great. And we had beautiful flights. In fact, he ended up doing loops around the theater on a regular basis and getting to the perch. And he knew what we wanted to do. He just knew that he couldn't do it the way we were trying to tell him to do it. So it was really um, uh, eye-opening and um, an important experience. I think it taught me to honor the animal as an animal in its own right. I'm not smarter than it. I'm just different than it. And so I should allow that animal to be the animal and to tell me what the right way to fly is. <laughs> so I, I, it makes me think about how I try to think about training too, is mm -hmm. that, um, that I, and to shift people's perspective uh, and that it let the animal train you. 
-hmm. to give you to give them a treat or get to give them a toy or to whatever it is. Um, and so that shifts that perspective, but it also brings up, you know, every interaction is a training opportunity. And I'm wondering when that, cause I've had that experience too. We were flying a fish eagle at the zoo and we wanted it to go to this one perch before it went into the pond to grab this plastic fish to demonstrate natural behavior. Wouldn't go, wouldn't go, wouldn't go, but kept going to this other tree. Finally, it was like, oh, why don't we just let them go to that tree? Who cares? You know, <laughs> you know, and I'm wondering when we finally let go of that expectation, whether or not that fish eagle or your auger buzzard said, finally, it took me this long to train you. You're a little slow there. <laughs> you humans are kind of slow. Kind of slow. <laughs> yeah. That's what I always think of. I think you're right. I want to hear what Amanda's story is. Oh, yeah. man. Aaron. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you have plenty of time to think about it. We're so. not interviewing me. <laughs> um, well, just to just because I do want to um, pull Aaron into this too, I'm, I'm going to make him a part of this story. Uh, but I guess first backing up. Um, so I took the first training trifecta seminar that I attended, my first official indoctrination into the fan club, um, I think was in 2016 when NWRA was in Oklahoma. Does that sound right? I think it was 2016. <laughs> yeah, it sounds right. <laughs> sure. Go with I that. feel like I learned a lot and I came home with like a, a very renewed sense of like, oh, okay, well, we're gonna change training. Um, Fortunately, I had a small amount of sense of like, I cannot change our entire like training methods and everything overnight for all of the birds all the time. Um, like I'm going to have to pick a couple to start with and let's, let's jump in. And I remember after the fact, um, emailing Gail a lot and bothering her because that's always fun uh, <laughs> to get some more advice. And I mean, really the change for us, the shift for us was, um, you know, moving toward a more, giving the birds more choice, allowing them to say no if they wanted to, honoring that answer, uh, and, and moving toward this, you know, least intrusive methods, kind of starting that journey. And I always found it a little, on, honestly, challenging to kind of share the perspective of this change in training, because I feel like talking about all the great stuff we're doing now you have to talk about the stuff that we were doing then mm -hmm. that we have chosen to not do anymore. Mm -hmm. And I always kind of hesitate because I, you know, I want people to fully understand the situation, but to me, I think it always comes back to Gail's favorite quote that she says inevitably in every single seminar. Do you want to say it, Gail? Maya. Oh, okay. I'm like, which one? <laughs> well, I'm not, I'm going to, it's not going to be the exact quote because I can never remember it, but when we know better, we need to do better. Yeah. I, I did the best that I could until I knew, knew better. better. And mm -hmm. now that I know better, I do better. And that is truly yeah. like the perfect summary of training, I think. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah. So I think, you know, we did not always, um, allow the animal to say no if it was time for a program of like okay well we gotta we gotta do it um but going down that road and moving toward um least intrusive methods and um and working together training together through all of this has really been uh, a lot of fun very challenging uh but i remember those first moments of of working with a, a barred owl which owls are a little, tr I, I cannot tell as clearly what's going on in there sometimes, right? Like I look at our falcons and it's like, you can see the wheels turning and all of that. Owls are kind of like, what is, what's happening in there? Um, but once we started putting very basic methods into place, like our barred owl was like, oh yeah, I'll, I'll come down and stand on the scale or I'll meet you up at this perch and, and we'll do a thing. And it was so cool. It was those aha moments that you were talking about earlier. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the, the big one that stands out to me that's fresh in my mind um, was within this past year and it involves Aaron and let's make sure that I can get through this story without crying about it too. Uh, but 
we had a uh, Broadway talk, Grayson, who went on so many programs and who was a very, a very good bird. But I think it became clear to us in her training that we probably weren't always allowing her to say no. We were counting on a lot of yeses or maybe interpreting some of her like, eh, I don't, I don't know, um, to like, okay, well, we got to go do a program. Um, and last year with the onset of the pandemic, I mean, we, we ceased all programs. Uh, we were not traveling anywhere by any means. And it became this really wonderful opportunity to take her off programs because we weren't doing any and really reset her training and just like, let's dial it way back. Let's just act like she's kind of a, a new bird and start working with her and giving her all of the choices and, and see what happens. Um, and it was really rewarding for me to work through that with her because once she like fully got it, it was, I don't know, it, it was just really special to be able to do that for her. And I think at the same time, Aaron was starting his bird handling. And I mean, Aaron came to us with no bird handling experience. He's, you know, he's like, sure, whatever, just tell me what to do and I'll do it. Uh, so getting to work with a new trainer who had no preconceived notions was kind of nice. Um, and coaching him through working with Grayson as well, and then seeing them make so much progress. So it was, it was Aaron's progress. It was Grayson's progress. We were recording a lot of it because we wanted to have good footage for this untamed episode too. So, um, so we were able to see a lot of that too. And um, the sad thing is that Grayson died unexpectedly um, in the very early part of 2021, which was very upsetting, um, not planned on and, and was tough for all of us. And uh, Aaron, being the video guy, made a little compilation um, of Grayson and, and, and their training together, but it was from the perspective of like Grayson teaching Aaron things too. And it was really nice and really lovely. And, uh, and I think that was, it was very special from my perspective to just see that unfold of like Aaron learned a lot. We got to do that for Grayson. It, um, I'm very sad still that she is no longer with us, but I'm glad that we got to do that for her. That's cool. That's a great Excellent. story. Yeah. Excellent story. Yeah. Do you have anything? Yeah, it's um, yeah, working with Grayson was was cool because, like Amanda said, I'd never even sort of been around animals in that respect. Um, and it was yeah, it was really interesting because everything that I learned coming in was was one hundred percent as far as Amanda and I'm, I'm sure the three of you can attest to as good of behavioral training as, as can be taught, I guess, at this point. And so it was a lot of being told no by an animal that doesn't speak English. And I didn't really understand. And that's why I was filming so much was that I was like, it's been three months. I don't think, I don't know what's going on, blah, blah. And there's, it's really funny because I had, I had the video I was recording when she decided to get on my glove and stay on my oh. glove for the first time. And you can, I've got my mask up, you can just see <laughs> I just froze and I was, I was like, I don't, I don't know what to do. And I like slowly walked her over towards the camera and like slowly put her up. And, up. and um, yes, it was just, it was just a really cool, it was one of those things like you were saying where it's, it's, it felt like Grayson was way more on top of it than I was the entire time. And she knew what was supposed to happen. She was like, you'll get it kid. Like, don't worry about it. We'll figure this out together. But um, yeah, it was it was tough to lose her after all that. But I mean, everything that she taught me was was you know invaluable. That's so. great. What a great way to start yeah. your journey. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. And you will never forget that. You will never forget that. Yeah. Um. Yeah. First birds, first animals that you train. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Well, I think that is a fantastic way to end this episode of Untamed, Unfiltered. Gail, Jackie, Melissa, thank you so much for joining us today. We, we appreciate it so much and for all of your stories and wisdom that you were able to bring to this episode of Untamed, Unfiltered. Thank you so much, the viewer, for tuning in for another episode. And this has been Untamed, Unfiltered. Thank you so much for watching and we will see you next time. Bye, everyone.
Three, two, three.